I am the University Club of Portland Building, in the heart of downtown Portland. I was built in the early 20th century to symbolize wealth and prestige for the city's elite. But my story goes much further. In the late 19th century, a group of prominent Portland citizens gathered with a common goal, to establish a club where they could socialize and network with like-minded individuals. It started in the office of local architect William Whitten. Mr. Whitten and his friends were white men from major universities in the U.S. and Canada. They called themselves the University Club, and on May 2, 1898, they signed my charter in Mr. Whitten's office. My first home was a club room in a building at the intersection of 6th and Alder. One of my members from that time, Frank Branch Riley, was interviewed at age 97 by the Oregon Historical Society. And here's what he had to say about my first location. You went up a flight of stairs. If you turned to the left, you went into a house of prostitution. If you turned to the right, you went into the university club. <laughs> Excellent. Which one did you go into? Well, we were in both. <laughs> In 1900, we moved to the fourth floor of a building at 3rd in Washington. Members played card games, and one of my members was a great piano player. I soon became one of the most exclusive clubs in the city, and by 1902, I had 125 members. The following year, members' wives were allowed to attend Wednesday night dinners and a few other functions, but were otherwise excluded. In 1905, I moved again to a house at the corner of Park and Stark Streets. That year, my members published my first hymnal, which contained many patriotic songs and drinking songs. That same year, members decided to build me a permanent home. More than 150 of them purchased bonds, and 18 guaranteed a major loan for my construction. My original cost, completely furnished, came to $133,913.56. I was constructed on the site of an old hotel and designed in the Jacobian Revival style to reflect the grandeur and elegance of my club members. I was elated as I would finally look my absolute best and be outfitted with all of the latest amenities. From a grand ballroom to a spacious library, I quickly became the social hub of Portland's upper class. In my new building, women who were immediate family members had their own private dining and retiring rooms and were allowed to visit from 11.30 in the morning until 8 at night. I felt terrific in 1913 and I was ready to party and celebrate countless special events and functions. I even once hosted President Woodrow Wilson. And somewhere after that time, my telephones had a direct line to a local taxi company, which paid me a kickback for every ride. The good times were cut short by the economic depression, combined with Oregon's enactment of prohibition laws, which they did three years before the rest of the country. In 1917, America joined the war against Germany. My members held lunches with military, government, and industry leaders. I had 133 educational members at that time for a total membership of 510. My board had found a way to profit, even without selling alcohol. It wasn't long before I started losing money again when 101 members left to serve in the war. That was soon followed by the great flu pandemic. Despite the threat of illness, an annual meeting was held, and at that time, members voted to cover the dues of those serving in the military. In 1924, after the construction of the Ambassador Apartments next door, I stopped hosting parties after 10.30 to avoid annoying the neighbors with loud talking and singing. For several decades after 1924, Many of my employees were from a tiny town in the Philippines on an island north of Manila. My beloved bartender, Theodore, was the first. 
he served drinks for nearly 50 years. He also invited many family members and relatives to work for me. It was a long-term, mutually beneficial relationship, and no fewer than 15 of his family members worked as bartenders, cooked in my kitchen, served as waiters, or staffed my reception desk. My members were some of the city's most influential and powerful people, and they used me as a platform to further their interests and ambitions. I entertained celebrities, politicians, and artists at luncheons and dinners almost every week. By 1932, the Depression was causing me more serious money woes. It was noted that my financial ups and downs had mirrored the stock market for practically all of my existence. Thankfully, Prohibition ended in 1933, and bars and clubs were allowed to serve beer and wine. But Oregon, my Oregon, was still very strict and its legislature enacted laws prohibiting the commercial sale or service of hard alcohol. The one loophole was that private clubs could allow the consumption of liquor if it was served from bottles owned by members. And that's when the bottle lockers were immediately added to my second floor. <laughs> 